it's a pleasure to be here tonight, uh, not only for the pleasure of meeting all of you folks, but I think uh, our company has had a tremendous connection with the University of Maryland over the last uh, 20, 25 years that I'm familiar with. We talked about the 175 graduates from here who uh, work at our company, but more than that, there's been a personal connection between our senior executives, our families, et cetera, with the university. Both my son and daughter uh, graduated, got different degrees uh, from the University of Maryland. I see my nephew, who's doing his PhD in physics out here. Uh, one of our leading, uh, the two of our executives uh, who helped me run the company have also strong connections, Paul Gasky, who runs our North American business, is a graduate from the University of Maryland. And our chief financial officer has his son out here. Right, he didn't want me to embarrass him. So I felt I had to do that, Philip, sorry. <laughs> but so we have, we have great, uh, great admiration and uh, affection for this university. And I hope this connection will continue to grow in the next few years. So what I've got arranged today is I've got a small video that will tell you a little bit about Hughes, uh, followed by a, a history of satellite communications that I'd like to give you my views on. Uh, then we'll have a PowerPoint presentation where we'll go into more detail on what Hughes does and the businesses we are in, and I'll follow that with a small talk of uh, what we think are important in terms of core values and how we feel our company has succeeded. So we'll try to do all of that in the next 50 minutes. Something, something like that if my voice holds off. So with that, we'll get the video going. Some people say it's a small world. Well, yeah, but you wouldn't want to wire it for cable. And though in a way it is small, it's getting more and more complicated every day. Some can accept that. Others, not so much. And some can change it. There have always been those whose vision has changed the world. Through perseverance and genius. Despite adversity, they lead through their ability to inspire us. I believe in this nation to commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. To reveal paths previously unknown and to guide us along those paths to our future. Inspiration. Innovation. It's ideas that move us forward. And ideas the world now takes for granted began with someone from Hughes asking, what if? How has Hughes changed the world? By connecting business, homes and communities, and government. is being realized each day by millions across the globe. The connectivity we provide is the path to that vision. And so we change the world. One connection at a time. We see no boundaries. We accept no limits. We act as if what we do makes a difference, because it does. Let your vision guide you, and the world will follow. The sky's the limit. Colleague Arunas uh, Selecki was responsible for creating this video for our sales and marketing meeting. Good job, Arunas. So I'd like to start my talk today of how an earlier generation of engineers created and developed satellite communications and helped to make this world a better place to live. I believe the communication satellite 
is indeed a machine that has changed the world and is one of the major engineering achievements of the 20th century. Let me give you some examples of how radically communication satellites have changed our lives. In 1914, the British explorer Ernest Shackleton had his ship, the Endeavour, become icebound in the Antarctic. The ship eventually had to be abandoned and his crew spent three years on a small Antarctic island before they were rescued. If this happened today, Shackleton could merely take his satellite phone, call London, ask for a rescue, call his wife and tell her he would be coming home late. <laughs> Somerset Mom wrote of a British diplomat in Africa who received one year of the London Times in the annual provisioning shipment. Each day he would carefully read the day's news just offset by one year. Today, he could watch CNN or BBC and instantly find out what is going on all over the world. In fact, as many of you know, during the Persian Gulf War, the American public watched the bombing of Baghdad as it happened while listening to CNN reporter Bernard Shaw's live commentary by satellite from a local hotel. More recently, all of us watched the events in Egypt and the Middle East live and followed the fall of the leaders as they occurred. More importantly, the people in these countries could not be kept in the dark, as TV broadcasts and satellite access to the internet thwarted all the efforts to suppress and censor information. Most profoundly, with global satellite coverage, hundreds of millions of people all over the world can receive satellite TV directly. They can watch CNN, BBC, Sky News, CNBC, and other news stations. We're all watching the same news at the same time. There are no longer distant places in the world. How did it all get started? At Hughes Aircraft Company in California, it got started with the cancellation of a fighter F-108 program in the late 1950s. Hughes had grown rapidly in the 50s, supplying the Air Force with equipment to shoot down Soviet bombers as part of the Cold War but now was confronted with the choice of layoffs or diversification. Not the first or last time for aerospace companies working on defense. Harold Rosen, a brilliant engineer at Hughes, had an idea for diversification. Why not geostationary communication satellites? The Russian scientist Konstantin Tsiolkovsky defined the geostationary orbit in 1895. At an altitude of 22,300 miles, a satellite in equatorial orbit would have a period of 24 hours and would appear stationary to any observer on Earth. In 1945, Arthur C. Clarke postulated that three such satellites could be space stations with television repeaters and could cover the entire Earth. Of course, in 95, such a system was not practical. But in 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik and began the space race. The US scrambled to develop launch vehicles and satellites, and communication satellites were quickly identified as an important potential application to space. AT&T, led by John Pierce, <coughs> initiated the design of a system called Telstar. It would consist of dozens of satellites in low Earth orbit with a global network of tracking antennas to provide global communications. Pierce believed it was not feasible to launch a communication satellite into geostationary orbit because you would have to put the satellite 22,000 miles up. He was also concerned about the one half second time delay associated with the round trip, travel time of two way conversations. But Harold Rosen and his team came up with some innovative ideas to reduce the mass of a communication satellite to less than 100 pounds, and it turned out that the time delay, though not desirable, was acceptable. The central idea of the Rosen team was to use a cylindrically shaped satellite which was spun about its axis to provide gyroscopic stability. For SYNCOM, the name given to the first, first Hughes satellite, the transmit and receive function was provided by a simple stick-like antenna aligned along the spin axis and providing a beam which intercepted the Earth and provided sufficient power for two-way voice communications. Later versions would despin the antenna to focus all the satellite's radiated energy towards the Earth 
providing sufficient power for video transmission. Harold first set out to sell his ideas in, in, inside Hughes. He went to the general manager of Hughes. Howard still lived those days, so the head of Hughes was called a general manager, and suggested Hughes build and launch his, its own satellite, just like AT&T. Highland was impressed by Rosen's passion, but skeptical. So he had an independent study conducted of the idea. The results of that study were that communication satellites would be good for voice communications, but there was only a demand for a handful of voice circuits in the world at that time. However, they thought that the international TV was not a good idea since the demand was unlikely to exceed one hour per week. <laughs> so much for predicting the future. Rosen and several of his team responded by offering to invest $10,000 of their own money to start a new venture for this development. This is now in the late 50s, and $10,000 was a lot more than Rosen made in a year <laughs> as part of his salary. Highland was impressed, but still skeptical. So what did Harold do? He flew to Boston to talk to the Raytheon company. They immediately offered him a job and support for the project if he came to work at Raytheon. This news altered Highland's perspective on CENCOM. He decided he would support Rosen to the extent of prototyping the satellite, and the rest is history. Meanwhile, President John Kennedy had made a profound political decision. He endorsed the creation of an international satellite consortium called Intelsat. It was to become the most successful international organization in history. The ComSat Act of 62 created ComSat as the US signatory and the organization responsible for managing and developing uh, the new satellite system for the world. ComSat was to be privately financed, publicly traded, with communication companies like AT&T and RCA owning significant but not controlling shares. Thus, AT&T had lost the battle to control international satellite communications like they controlled the telephone networks through its own Telstar system. ComSat set up an R&D organization called ComSat Labs here in the Washington, D.C. area. And I was very fortunate to be offered a job by them in 68 as a fresh, given, as a fresh graduate and given an opportunity to develop cutting-edge technology for the new satellite communication systems being deployed. In July 1962, AT&T launched Telstar One and demonstrated transatlantic TV to major public acclaim. Unfortunately, the TV show had to be shot since the orbiting satellite soon moved out of sight of the tracking antennas. <laughs> the first SYNCOM was launched in February of 1963 by a Delta rocket. John Kennedy made the first telephone call from Washington to Africa on SYNCOM 2, and SYNCOM 3 transmitted for the first time live television coverage of the 1964 Olympics from Japan. The feasibility of geostationary communication satellites had clearly now been demonstrated, and the battle was over. CINCOM had demonstrated the superiority of geostationary satellites over low Earth orbit satellites, and ComSat chose Hughes to build its first Intelsat 1 satellite called Early Bird, which was launched in April 65. It was the first of hundreds of communication satellites to follow. Soon the Cold War environment, the bipolar communist, communist world versus the free world was replaced by a multilateral global economy and an era of global, globalization began. Most countries decided to become part of the global economy and improve their standard of living. This meant they needed to improve their infrastructure, power, transportation, and communications. Satellite communications was an ideal way for instant infrastructure improvement. It's faster to deploy a system by satellite than by terrestrial means, and many countries chose that route. It was impossible to fund all the necessary improvements through public money raised through taxation, and so to obtain private capital, it became necessary to privatize and deregulate much of the infrastructure development, including the satellite infrastructure. <coughs> In the early years, almost all satellite communication companies were government-owned or government-backed. And now, almost all of them are privately owned, many of them openly trading in equity markets. And it's a whole new ball game. 
The next 10 years was to see an explosion of satellite communications across, across the globe and in the US. New satellite systems were deployed in Japan, Thailand, Malaysia, India, Brazil, China, Sweden, Norway, Mexico, Russia, and a lot of other places. For me, it was an exciting time because I, we could see satellite communications becoming such an important part of globalization. The importance of the satellite to these countries was evident by the personal participation of some of the most powerful people in these countries. They understood that the deployment of satellite communications would have a profound effect on the culture and economy of their country. People like Habibi in Indonesia, Thaksin Shinawatra in Thailand, Matahir Muhammad of Malaysia, and Jiang Zemin of China were among the many government and industry leaders who became heavily involved in their satellite communication systems. By the mid-80s, the Hughes business strategy was in place. New technology and higher-powered satellites used more efficiently would generate new applications and provide service opportunities which would be exploited by Hughes. The manufacturing business had an overcapacity by a factor of two and margins were less than 10%, whereas the service sector could generate margins 10 times that of the manufacturing business, although greater investments and risk were requ required. This strategy of evolving from manufacturing to services was ultimately adopted by virtually all satellite manufacturing companies. Major efficiencies were obtained through compressed digital communications combined with the, uh, high, highly compressed chipsets that could be installed in ground equipment. The combination of higher efficiency, higher power satellites, and smaller, lower cost ground stations had led to an important new phase of satellite communications. For example, Intelsat 1 required a 100 foot diameter antenna on the ground to receive one TV signal. On the other hand, today's satellites transmit hundreds of TV channels into an 18 inch receiver antenna. So since then, three major applications have evolved for satellites, direct broadcast, mobile communications, and broadband communications. Today, the direct broadcast satellites broadcasting over a large area into small dishes is the most powerful application of satellite communications. The resultant economies of scale make satellites so much more efficient than alternate terrestrial technologies. For example, it costs a cable company approximately $2,000 to connect a home to their system, while for a satellite TV, uh, direct TV or EchoStar, it costs approximately $200. In 94, Hughes launched the first of several DirecTV satellites and became the first high-power digital-to-home, direct-to-home satellite TV broadcaster. They deliver hundreds of channels of high-quality digital imagery and CD-quality sound and have become an enormous success with almost 20 million customers. Very soon after that, a young entrepreneur, Charlie Ergen, who's going to be our new boss, started EchoStar to compete against DirecTV and has over 13 million subscribers using direct-to-home satellite technology. This has spread like wildfire all over the world. Direct-to-home services now are offered in almost every corner of the world. In fact, in India alone, there are five com com companies competing in this market with each of them offering hundreds of TV channels. So these new applications will drive the future of satellite communications. The global growth of the internet will continue to lead to more high throughput capacities like a satellite that we at Hughes are building called Jupiter and they will be launched all over the world. Streaming broadband, app, broadband applications like Netflix will require significant growth in bandwidth. Direct broadcast of radio programming for both mobile radios in developed countries and fixed radios in developing countries is another thriving application. New applications where you combine digital satellite TV and radio and uh, will lead to new data services like TiVo. And the growth of compressed digital TV and audio will also stimulate many applications, high def TV being one major one. So I see a bright future for the satellite communications industry with a predicted growth rate of 10 to 15%. So with that, I'd now like to take you through a PowerPoint presentation where we'll go into more detail about Hughes Network Systems. I think 
<coughs> so the first slide here okay, goes a little bit his, in, into the historic heritage of innovation that we at Hughes have gone through. As I mentioned earlier, in 65, Hughes launched uh, Early Bird, and we formed um, a company that's a predecessor of our company here called Digital Communications Corporation in 1971 that was born from a few people from ComSat Laboratories in a garage in Rockville, Maryland. In fact, my brother was Pradeep, who's here, was the first employee that they had. And this company decided to make their uh, charter the, the ground system part of satellite communications, which was a wide open field at that time. Canada launched the first nationally owned satellite called Anik A in the world, followed by Galaxy One in the United States. We in, at DCC at that time developed the first VSAT in the mid 80s, followed by different products, not only for the data world, but the telephony earth station for voice, the set top box for direct TV, and then the two way uh, internet access terminal that's become the uh, the major product for us. We called it DirectWay, and then when we separated from DirectTV, it's called HughesNet. <coughs> we also produced the world's first combined satellite mo GSM mobile uh, system called Fotoraya in the Middle East. We sold almost 11 million set-top boxes and have continued the development uh, of uh, different products for both broadband internet access through a new satellite called Spaceway 3, which we launched in 2007, and the new one, the Jupiter, that I'll talk a little bit more about. We now have over 500,000 subscribers in the United States, paying an average ARPU of uh, $75 per month. So what is Hughes today? We are a leader in broadband satellite services and technology. We serve the consumer and small and medium business segment. We serve the enterprise, government, and the mobile satellite market. A fundamental strategy that we had, which we started implementing about 15 years ago, was that we wanted to be more than just a technology uh, and a manufacturing company. And we, we decided, as I was mentioning earlier, that the margins that you got on manufacturing products were just not sustainable and high enough. Everything would become a commodity. So we decided we would go into the service business where we could make significantly higher margins. But rather than give up our heritage of technology and manufacturing, we decided to do the two together. So fundamentally, we set our target of getting to a stage where 50% of our revenues would come from service and 50% of our revenues would come from uh, selling products. Today, by the way, that number has gone 70% service and 30% uh, hardware because the cost of hardware obviously uh, keeps uh, getting driven down. And it's good because what we do is we use our technology to give us a competitive advantage against our service competitors. And then we use the volumes of product that we use for our own services to give us a competitive advantage against uh, other technology hardware companies. So the result is this circle keeps growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And we are very happy at the mix now that we have of 70, 75% service and 25% uh, technology. I think that's a sustainable strategy for the future. We're a strongly engineering driven company, which is why we hire a lot of engineers from the University of Maryland. And I was just talking to Dean Pines. He's also a fellow Berkeley graduate. So we, we, we share a, a good heritage. So we have a total staff all over the world of between our uh, US operations and our subsidiaries and other parts of the world of 940 engineers, with about 72% of them being software and 28% being hardware and systems guys. Uh, in the US, out of the 550 people approximately, we have 300 people with advanced degrees, and internationally, out of the 400 people approximately, we have 130 with advanced degrees. And between <laughs> all of them, we own 500 patents. And our, our, you know, just to show you that that's a very important part of our company and will continue to be in the future. 
What are the technologies that we focus on? I won't obviously go into all of them, but <coughs> excuse me. System engineering, modulation encoding, RF, VLSI, you name it, we do it. And then we develop, we use all these technologies to develop systems and products and applications. And you know what sets us apart from other companies? Uh, we like to think we're a great place to work. When we look at all the parameters of uh, how you evaluate that, uh, generally our, our turnover rates are two to three percent less than the industry. Uh, we find in surveys, we get the workplace excellence seal of approval. We've received it for the last 10 years from the Montgomery Alliance. We have all kinds of facilities, but the most important is the excitement of the projects, which is very important when we talk to young people, and then the culture of working hard, playing hard with an entrepreneurial spirit. If you look at our global market, you can see on this chart that we are expecting to see significant growth in almost all parts of the world. Then obviously North America is our base, and that will continue to be a, a major part of our, uh, our business but Western Europe and Asia are also rapidly growing. We operate a global satellite network and we are taking rapidly a global, uh, I mean, leadership in the KA sp space segment. As you see on this chart, in North America, we operate over almost 15 satellites. Uh, is, our networks are operating with that. Internationally, in Europe, there are about six satellites in Asia about five, and South America about four. On top of that, we have our brand new satellite that's being built called Jupiter, which will have a capacity of 100 gigabits, which will cover North America. And we are doing our current business planning to put two more similar satellites, one to cover potentially India, and the other one to cover Brazil. <coughs> We've shipped more than two and a half million terminals worldwide to over 100 countries and had a, have a market share of greater than 50%. As you can see on this chart, a lot of those terminals are in North America, but we are still, we've penetrated almost all the major countries in the world with a significant amount of terminals. So our combined services and technology business model has allowed us to grow our consumer segment at a, a compounded annual growth rate of service revenues of 17% and an adjusted EBITDA of almost 16%. You can see the breakdown between our different businesses. Enterprises represents about 467 million. Consumer, which is growing the fastest of them all, at 434 million. And you can see our total revenues in 2009 was over a billion dollars. We are today the largest uh, consumer satellite uh, uh, provider, broadband uh, provider in North America, with a long history of leadership in this space. You can see on the pie chart that our market share is about 53% in the US. Uh, Viasat is our biggest competitor with about 45% of the market. We have a history of leadership, first to market, with the KU band VSATs, first KA band satellite project, and we won various awards from industry forums that confirmed that leadership. If you look at our subscribers and the characteristics of our subscribers, you know, unlike what common intuition would let, lead you to believe that most of the subscribers would be in the uh, thinly populated areas, you find that generally our subscribers also are where people are. So, you know, they. They tend to be, even though we don't go into the major urban areas and compete with cable and, and DSL, but we are at the outskirts of the major areas. Obviously, the red is the most dense uh, concentration of our customers, and the, uh, the purple is the least. But fundamentally, majority of the customers that we have for HughesNet are in areas not served by cable or DSL. So about 92% of our customers uh, are in those unserved areas, and about 8% are within cable and DSL. And because of this, you know, when President Obama came up with this broadband stimulus uh, program recently, we were very fortunate to be, they, they kept only a small piece for satellites because it's still a 
strong satellite bias in this world. But uh, we were fortunate to be the only national winner of the broadband stimulus and uh, got 58 million out of the 100 million dollars that they gave for the stimulus. 58 of that was given to our company. So if you look at um, the growth in subscribers that we've had in this consumer business, the compounded annual growth has been about 18.6 percent. We had 545,000 as of uh, June 2010, and, and it's close to 600,000 today. Our average revenue per user has climbed from 51 to 73 dollars because the, each user, once he's in, wants more bits and higher speeds and more value-added services, and all of that uh, helps a lot. And our revenues have also grown, obviously, uh, simultaneously. So we're targeting the underserved and unserved cust customer in the United States. So this is a guy that cannot get this service from cable or DSL because we didn't want to go and get into a pricing war with the cable and DSL guys. So this represents a, a market of 10 to 15 million households and three and a half million small businesses. We expect this to grow at 10 to 15 percent in the next five years, and we have a lot of capacity being built for satellites to fuel that. What we're very excited about these days is a new satellite that we, I've talked a little bit about called Jupiter. This will be launched in um, early 2012. We'll have <coughs> 100 gigabits of capacity, 80 up, 20 down with 60 spot beams that you see in the bottom of this slide covering the regions where we expect most of our customers. Now just to give you a feel of why we're so excited about it, prior to this, the satellite with the most uh, capacity was Spaceway 3, which we launched in 2007. That had 10 gigabits of capacity. So really what we're saying in three, four years, we have increased the technology and the capacity of a satellite by an order of magnitude, you know, by a factor of 10. And what makes that even more exciting is if you look at the capital efficiency part of this chart, Spaceway 3 had a capital efficiency of $40 million per gigabit. That is because each satellite, by the time you launched it, costs you $400 million. So each gigabit was worth $40 million. With Jupiter, will drive that down to $4 million. So the economics of the business changes dramatically. And that's, that's really the thing that's driving our excitement as to the next year or two. <coughs> now, people say, you know, what, what will you do with this extra capacity? What will you, what, what is, how does it help the user? So we have come up with this concept of the home of tomorrow that will get, with Jupiter, could get up to 14 to 20 megabits of service into the home. And in that home, you know, you would use maybe up to 10 megabits for web browsing and downloads. You could, you, you could have voiceover IP applications, which doesn't take much bandwidth. Video conferencing at one and a half megabits. Home security, uh, nanny cams up to one and a half megabits. And of course, what's really exciting is the streaming of video services up to seven megabits. So if you combined all of this and gave all this capability to, to the home, we think that's very, going to be very, very exciting in the future. In the enterprise business, you know, we, we, we have, this is what we started off. This is the base that we work. We have a tremendous business, not only in the United States, but all over the world, with about 115 major corporations as customers in the United States, with 144,000 sites and uh, uh, great revenues and good margins. And if you look at some of our customers in the different uh, vertical industries, you can see all the major names in the, in, in the world that you can think of. In the petroleum industry, you know, prob the probability that when you go fill gas in your car, when you put your credit card into the pump, that your transaction is being handled by our system is almost 95%, because we have over 60,000 of these gas stations hooked into our network. So you plug in your card, a message goes to a, a data, a host computer somewhere, they validate your card, turn the pump on, and then when you fill up 25 gallons or whatever, that transaction is recorded and, and billed to you. Hospitality is, is big. Retail, as you can see, 
<coughs> is, is being the leader. Our first customer was Walmart, Sam Walton himself. And in fact, it's an interesting story. When we came up with the idea of a VSAT network, we had not built one. We just had a bunch of uh, those days view graphs that uh, discussed the, uh, the, the concept. So we presented the idea to Walmart, who had 2,000 stores in rural America, and the deregulation of the phone companies was occurring, and he couldn't go to one place and get a national network. And so they were a frustrated group of people, and we went in and said, look, let's just bypass the, all the phone companies. We'll put a hub at your headquarters in Bentonville, Arkansas, and we'll put a little dish on all your stores, and you can have voice, data, and video capability. Sam used to like to, on Saturdays, have a pep rally with all his employees, where he would go rah-rah, et cetera. So he gave us a contract. We were a $70, 80000000 million company at that time. He gave us a $20 million contract without any proof that we could make this thing work. <laughs> and, and he was personally involved. And in fact, uh, I think a couple of years ago, Fortune magazine had a list of 75 decisions that companies have made that were significant enough to make that list. And Sam Walton's decision to use our VSAT for his uh, communications network was number 25 or so on that list. It's an int interesting story. But once Sam did something, everybody else followed him usually. And so you could see on this list that every major retailer has, uh, has followed us in there. And there are interesting stories with all of them. We can do it sometime, some other time. But we have a great list of customers, and they continue to be with us. Internationally, we have been focused primarily on the enterprise business. We haven't gone to the consumer world yet, but we soon will. And you can see the split of our international business between the different uh, regions of the world. Probably two of the fastest growing uh, regions are uh, India and Brazil in Latin America. And we expect to see great things from, from, from those regions. And you can see the mix of service and hardware revenues about 60, 40 internationally. Now, where are, where are the growth opportunities in our international business? We have the managed network services, which is very similar to what we do in, uh, in North America, similarly broadband internet access. But we have two other applications that have been very exciting and have been growing uh, nicely over the last few years. One is education, distance learning. We're finding that in countries like India, Brazil, China, Russia, the, the requirement, there are not enough teachers around to educate uh, the, the, the people, and especially in the rural and unserved areas. And the ability to have a, a, a system instantly with a, with a live classroom, a live professor, and have a two-way interactive uh, distance learning system is very, very interesting. And we are pursuing that idea with great vigor in many of these countries. You can see our, um, some of our key customers in financial services, oil and gas, government, et cetera, internationally. So, so, sorry. so that brings up you know, this, this issue of what is important of what we're doing internationally. And I think it's really not only internationally, but in the United States, is bridging the digital divide. You know, that's a nice slogan. All of us talk about it. Every politician talks about it. But it's clearly something that satellite communications does very well. In the United States, I mentioned we won a $58.7 million award uh, from the stimulus uh, part. In Russia, we have an e-Russia initiative where there are 8,000 rural ISPs and schools on our system. In uh, India, we have 11,000 kiosks in small towns and villages for distance learning, e-governance, high-speed internet access. These are franchisees that we franchise. They, they buy the, the VSAT and two or three PCs, and they actually sell time to the people like a public call office uh, and get access to the net or get educational courses. In Mexico, we have a rural telephony, over 30,000 lines. In Brazil, we're doing stuff for high-speed internet and e-governance at agencies and schools and uh, of in the state of Amazonas. And you can see some of these uh, VSATs, right? Interesting pictures, like on boats, on rooftops, in pretty rustic, tough areas, and satellites keep on ticking. 
the, uh, this, uh, this slide shows you some of these uh, charts, uh, some of these VSATs uh, in the kiosks in India. Uh, you can see these kiosks where people are taking like educational courses and then some rural ISPs in, in Russia. The next area, of course, we're focusing on is uh, mobility. You know, satellites are also great for mobility because you can't take a fiber with you in the car as, as, as you drive. You have, to, you have to be able to connect. So we have the same platforms that work on maritime systems. We're now installing these systems um, in Southwest Airlines and hopefully many other airlines so you can have broadband internet access in a plane as, 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 as you're flying trains. Uh, and we have different... All the major mobile satellite operators are our customers, and we're doing various types of terminals uh, with those folks. So in concluding about HNS, we are the world's number one provider. We have a great consumer business, and we have, uh, for the enterprise world, managed services, and we also provide a lot of technology to the world's premier mobile sat operators. And we're a proud training and employment partner with the University of Maryland. Okay, so that's enough about uh, about H and S. <coughs> Last, lastly, I was asked to talk a, a little bit about why Hughes has been so successful, starting with our culture. And I think the first thing I always like to say is it, our culture is based on some core values. Now, these core values were not values that we came up last year or this year. We actually wrote these down almost 25 years ago. And to this day, is something we passionately believe in and uh, practice every, every day of our lives. And what are those four, four core values? The first one was commitment. I think we all believed it's extremely important to do what you say you'll do. Not only to your boss, to your company, to your wife, to your kids, to your friends. That, that fundamental belief that if you commit to something, you must do it, is a very, very important uh, core value to us. Secondly, innovation. We want to be thinking state of the art. We always tell each other, work smart. You know, it's not necessary that you have to put in 80 hours every week, but if you work smart and be innovative, that the gains from that would be significant. And part of that is taking calculated risks. You know, if everything you did was successful, it's clearly not good enough. You're not going to be taking enough risks. And the ability for people to take risks and understand that if they fail, they're not going to be punished, they're not going to be hurt, is an important part of the culture uh, of, of our company. Thirdly, trust. We, we, we really believe that demonstrating our integrity in all our actions is critical. We ought to be able to trust each other and present the truth in a direct and helpful manner. And lastly, of course, open communications. I, you know, I can't uh, tell you how many times when things get really screwed up, how many times the main reason is because people didn't openly communicate with each other. And that how important that ability of people to not have any fear always felt fear is debilitating. That the ability for a person to come and tell you what he thinks is very critical. And we work hard at our company to keep all the doors open in our offices so people can walk and people never get, never get to feel that they are, uh, <coughs> because they disagree about something, that it's a big problem. Now these are our core values. But what about leadership? How do we foster growth of new leaders? So the idea is, you know, what are the essential attributes of leaders? I can tell you they come in all shapes and sizes, but share a few common traits. The first one is passion. You must have passion in whatever you do. Whatever the endeavor, whether it's sports, music, painting, or running a business, unless there's real passion in the doing, there can only be mediocrity. It's pretty simple. If you have a passion for something, then it doesn't work because you love it. We always tell each other that the day we wake up in the morning and we're not raring to go to work is the day we ought to retire or the day we ought to quit. You must have that passion. And no amount of self-will 
can overcome apathy about your work. So if you're not happy about your work, change it. Harnessing your own passion and learning how to unlock it in other people, I think is one of the fundamentals of leadership. Indeed, inspiring people to act is what sets great leaders apart. And it's their passion about whatever it is that motivates them and in turn the people they inspire. Inspire people and they will love going to work and be happier and more productive. And it follows that the, so will the organizations they're part of. Now there's no special formula I can give you about discovering your own passion or inspiring others except to say you'll know it when you have it and when you don't. In my case, I was 26 when I joined my former boss who had started DCC in that Rockwell garage. It was his passion that inspired me to make the leap. It certainly wasn't the clarity of their business plan or any superbly crafted spreadsheet. I don't think they had spreadsheets those days, right? <laughs> I don't actually remember even seeing one. But, <laughs> but their collective energy and focus on a single goal was clear, to develop new communication systems in this new field of satellite communications. I firmly believed in my gut we'd be the best in the world, though at the time I wasn't sure how because we were competing against all the major telecom companies in the world like Raytheon, Harris, NEC, Fujitsu, Alcatel, and so on. But we did it, and we have been market leaders in the segment for the last 40 years. Yes, 40 years, and we don't intend giving up that leadership soon. But many times you don't succeed the first time. So with passion, you must have perseverance. Call it the work ethic or never give up. It goes together with passion and is essential to succeed in business, particularly in the early years when few believe in your dream. In my case, our little DCC upstart managed to survive a few major changes in ownership. We have one more happen last week. <laughs> and although each new ownership event presented challenges to keep people focused and to maintain morale, the company got stronger and more resilient each time. Try to think of any 40-year enterprise that has gone through multiple ownership changes but still has the same core management team that was there from the beginning. And not just continuing in survival mode each time as the next owner appeared, but aggressively growing the business. Why? Because of passion and perseverance and loyalty. Someone once said an ounce of loyalty is worth a pound of cleverness it's loyal people that get you through the hardest times, as I can attest. And you must always remember loyalty is a two-way street. <coughs> now, having these attributes alone doesn't guarantee that a CEO can build and lead a successful enterprise. They're necessary but not sufficient conditions. The leader must translate his or his passion for the business into a vision of where the organization is heading and how it will get there and then get everyone to buy into it and establish a culture of success. Everyone must believe they're going to win and that they belong to a team of winners. An open, unselfish culture is essential to yield innovative products and services that fuel business growth, especially in a high-tech company. So we all must practice it, starting with me, and yes, my door is always open because if we don't, Innovation will give way to bureaucracy, leading to unhappy employees and customers. Every employee must understand their role in the company's success and feel part of it, which means that every manager must ensure they practice what they preach. <coughs> Our talented engineers have spawned many innovations, and the company has hundreds of patents as evidence, but technology alone doesn't lead to business success. It takes all parts of the company, and all parts must live and breathe the same culture. So in conclusion, one recipe for successful leadership of a high-tech company, which has worked for us at Hughes, is to establish a set of core values that are clearly communicated and practiced consistently. Be passionate about your work and build a loyal team around you that shares that passion. Establish a culture of success so people feel like winners fulfilling the vision of the company. So for Hughes, during the last 40 years, 
our core values of innovation, trust, commitment, and open communications, supplemented by passion, perseverance, and loyalty, have created a culture and has worked well for us and is really the secret recipe of our success. So I'd like to end this talk on a personal note. I graduated with a master's degree, as uh, Dean Annan said, from Cal Berkeley in 68. It was a time when the job market was booming and a young engineer could get a great job easily. My faculty advisor uh, was your former dean, Howard Frank, and I had written my thesis on computer networking and had a great job offer from a large computer company. Famous three letters. I was about to ac accept the offer when by sheer accident I was visiting my parents in Washington on a, for a weekend and a gentleman from this company called me on a Saturday afternoon and asked, said he had heard of me and would like to talk to me about a job. I was signed up to play a cricket match at the Ellipse in downtown Washington, so I was in my cricketing whites and didn't want to be bothered because I knew what I was going to do. He insisted, he persevered and said, look, just stop by for an hour and let's talk. When I met him, his passion, excitement, and vision of this field of satellite communications, and to be honest, I didn't know what satellite communications was at that time, were so powerful that he offered and I accepted the job at ComSat Labs that same afternoon. And so the lesson from that is don't be sure you know the way forward. Just, you know, and you never know what will happen timing, luck, et cetera, and since then, that, that changed my life completely. With that, I became a satellite communications bigot and have remained that since. <laughs> From seeing a satellite launched on a powerful rocket into, into space, with your pulse racing every time you see a launch, to seeing applications like TV, internet access, actually work when you send the signal 22,000 miles into space and aim at a little satellite, out there and see the signal come back in the form that you want to is extremely satisfying. But the best part is that I've been fortunate to be part of a team at ComSat and Hughes that has really made a real difference in this world, changing the lives of millions of people and making it better. That's as good as it gets for an engineer. Thank you very much. you're going to have to use the mic. We can't hear you down here. Sorry. My name is Mansoor Haseeb, and I enjoyed your uh, conversation with us today and sharing the insight about Hughes Network Systems. And I truly agree with your concept of having passion and doing something that you're passionate about, because that's the only way you're going to be good at it. So my, re my question is about your research and innovation, because you mentioned that that was one of your competitive advantages, and that's how you wish to lead the company and distinguish your company. So can you share some light on some possible partnerships that you might have in this space with, say, academia or other institutions, is this something that you feel like could give you an accelerate, acceleration in your number of innovations and perhaps the speed of innovations? Because suddenly, instead of having 900 employees, you could have 20,000 as you partner with academia. Right. No, it's a very, very good point, and it's something we, we do some of it. In fact, we have some partnerships with the University of Maryland. Uh, we, we have some alumni who work closely uh, Professor Barris and uh, yeah, right there, and uh, with, with with some other folks. So we have programs. We are part of your cyber program uh, that we are working with you. We certainly believe very strongly in it. We probably could do more, and it's just a matter of finding the time and the people. Then the way it works and is successful is if you get a champion within your company who says, "I'll I'll work that." I know Professor Barris has been working with John Kenyon. A, a lot, and John uh, uh, loves this university, and he loves working with the university. So we need more of those kinds of people. I can do that. All right, great. 
Love to have you come over and talk to some of our guys in engineering. OK. Yes, sir. Targeting what? Yeah, yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, the whole field of telemedicine is one of the major applications that we are pursuing. Uh, you know, the ability to transmit images, x-rays, MRIs, get them read by experts in, uh, in other parts, especially in some of the emerging markets. Uh, it's, it's clearly, in my opinion, one of the applications that will grow a lot. The trouble is the money. Okay. Well, we're. I think if you look at our Indian uh, subsidiary and our Brazilian subsidiary, they're working in uh, with some local medical institutions, etc. Uh, I think in India there's a very famous hospital chain called Apollo Hospital that we've done some uh, some work with. Uh, the problem always that I find in the health field is coming up with money. People don't have as much funds as we probably should have to pursue it, but. Technically, it's a it's an ideal application. It's an ideal application. Hi, Dr. Gupta. Anil Gupta, professor at the Smith School. Uh, two un unrelated questions. One is, uh, in terms of geographies, uh, uh, there was not much about you know one major geography, China. So, uh, you know, what are the issues there? Uh, uh, the second, very different question is that it's not easy for companies, most companies, to make the transition from a product company to a service company. And how did Hughes manage the, the challenges in that transformation? Yeah. I mean, they're both very good questions. Uh, China has is, is been an enigma for us. We first started uh, doing business in China probably in the mid-'80s, you know, when China was opening up. And we were selling systems. But remember, at that time, everybody in China was the government. Every institution was owned by the government. So we were really selling products to the government. Then we went through the phase when they started fall, you know, breaking up into the deregulation and private industry started getting involved. And we suddenly saw the market uh, dry up uh, in, in, uh, in communications because everybody would go to China Telecom or China Unicom or China Net. And you, you didn't have the ability to go and sell to an enterprise competing against AT&T like we do here. And so our business in China just shriveled to nothing. But in the last year or so, we have just established a new joint venture with a very good Chinese partner. And we sort of feel that the cycle is now, the pendulum is swinging back. And we have, we have, we're very hopeful that we'll see a resurgence of our China business in the next, because it's ideal for satellite communications, obviously. It's large, it's got coverage requirements and, and applications, et cetera. So I'm hoping that in the next two years, we'll see some, uh, some success in, in, in China. But we are back in China with a venture with some people and so on. You know, your, your other question of converting from a technology manufacturing company to a service company is also a very good thing because it changes. You, you need a totally different culture. We used to be a company that uh, would deliver products to another service provider and then let the, that guy live with all the issues, the problems, et cetera. When we built our first... Uh, uh, consumer product, one of our leading engineers said, you mean this has to work all the time? <laughs> and the answer was, yeah. If you don't, he's going to pick up the phone and yell at you. <laughs> I used to sometimes get calls at 10 o'clock at night, 10.30 at night. My system doesn't work. What do you want me to do at 10.30 at night? <laughs> but we slowly learned that lesson, that when you go and sell a service, that people expect a level of uh, 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 availability, a level of uh, uh, performance that is far, far beyond just selling boxes. And it was four or five years of pain, painful learning. And I think we've gotten very good at it now. And uh, hopefully, we'll continue to do better. But you need good people. We had to hire different sets of people with different skill sets, as opposed to the pure uh, hardware and software engineers that we had. We had. Uh, We've built a call center organization in five different call centers all over the world. We've built a, a nationwide installation and maintenance 
uh, organization which we never had before. We have thousands of people who are not direct employees, but we offer a mean time to repair of two to four hours anywhere in the United States. <coughs> so you have to build up all those capabilities that we didn't have in our company. Took a little time, took a little pain, but we were fortunate to be able to go through it and uh, uh, come out successful on the other side. Hello. Hi. Yeah, um, my name is Michelle. I'm a student, senior in accounting and finance. I just have a question about uh, a growing issue that I specifically talk about um, cleaning the space after all those um, satellites become obsolete. What, what kind of action your company is taking as a leader of, of the market to show that uh, you, you are leading in also in that direction? Right now, we only own one satellite. <laughs> so, so we're not, uh, Intelsat owns 53. But what happens is, it's a very good question. If you look at the Earth's gravitational field, it looks like an apple, okay, like this. And when a satellite is in a particular location, it tends to drift towards that part of the apple that's, we call it the satellite graveyard, okay. When a satellite is in operation, it drifts a little bit, and we fire a little rocket and push it back to its normal position. And then it drifts again, we push it back. It drifts again, we push it back. And the life of a satellite is determined by that action, because once you run out of fuel to push it back, it keeps going this way and goes into this uh, satellite graveyard. And that's really where all these dead satellites will eventually be. And it'll stay up there. Very few of them, if any, that I know of drop you know, drop to Earth. I think it's a, it's plenty of space there for all of these guys. Yeah, it's 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 Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's all of the above. You know, we t obviously, a lot of our people with advanced degrees are in sales and marketing. They're not all engineers. But uh, we have a strong engineering field. We have a strong sales and marketing capability. We have a strong manufacturing organization. And uh, we make sure, we, and we, of course, outsource. We do some of our manufacturing in China uh, for some of our products. And some of our call center employees are outsourced in India and the Philippines, and, and uh, a lot of our software development is done in India through uh, some of our own people and some other outsourced. So all of the above gets balanced as the need arises. But we are investing you know, close to 56, 60 million dollars a year in, in our own company funded R&D. And then we get customers to fund probably another 25, 30 million. So we spend about 80, 90 million dollars a year in doing product development. One last question. Right. Mr. Call, uh, your industry has some interesting constraints that most other industries don't have, and that there's only a finite amount of space for those satellites up there. Uh, isn't, if I recall, that's uh, by international treaty. Mm -hmm. So how does a private company like you uh, negotiate for, for spots? Yeah, that's a good question. What, what happens is the, the international, ITU is the, op, the global organization that, <coughs> that assigns these slots. So the first step they do is based on a complicated system of filings, et cetera, they assign slots to countries. So for example, the US will get slots A through, through D. And then the US companies in turn file with the FCC to get, uh, <clears throat> to get access to these slots under a very complex set of rules and whose files first, et cetera. But what has happened with this is the satellite communication industry started using call C-band, which was the six gigahertz and four gigahertz band. And pretty soon that got filled up and there were no more slots available. So they moved to what we call KU band, which is the 14 and 12 gigahertz frequency band. And that's pretty much reaching its uh, full capacity today. So now we've gone to KA band, which is the higher frequency. And that's still empty. You know, there aren't that many. So the technology is forcing people and 
devices are being developed at these higher frequencies. Next step will be the V band. And uh, so we'll keep moving up till there's enough uh, capacity available for anybody who's interested. Oh, no, there's thousands, thousands of miles up there. You know, you got 22, when you're at 22,000 miles, these satellites are placed two degrees apart, not from a physical constraint, but from an interference constraint. So a satellite at this, at say 95 degrees, you know, you, you have to meet certain rules if they're all operating in KU frequency band, let's say, from interfering in the satellite two degrees away at 97 degrees. <laughs> from another KU satellite. But I can certainly put a KA satellite in that same slot and not have to worry physically about, uh, about any physical collision. The only fear we all, all of us have in satellite communication is that one day a meteor is going to hit one of these satellites, which is possible, but luckily hasn't happened yet. That scares some of our customers. Well, I think the technology is here to really exploit it in a big way and to, to increase the reach of each of your professors and each of your courses in a very, very significant manner at a very reasonable cost. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm personally very excited because I've seen the impact in India where we have started this as a business. We not only sell the connectivity, but we sell the course as a as a business, and we've, we've, we have agreements with the Indian Institute of Management and the Indian Institute of Technology, where we actually go to the studio in the institute, and we have a live professor, and the video is broadcast. We have classrooms in 32 major cities, and then we have these 10,000 kiosks. So the same course is broadcast to, because satellites are great for broadcasts, is broadcast to the 32 classrooms with 20 students each, and the 10,000 kiosks, and each student pays us X rupees per course, and half of that goes to the institute, and half of that we keep. So it's developing into a very successful business model also, and at the same time, the value of a good professor in the Indian Institute of Management, you know, in one, one sitting for two hours, uh, he's reaching maybe 1,000 students or 2,000 students spread out all over the country. So you can see the power power of that, and I think over oh, the next few years, I think we're going to see an explosion in India, China, Russia, Brazil, you know, these countries where people are hungering for good education and diplomas and degrees. In fact, we have been doing, I, I unfortunately couldn't catch up with uh, John, but I know we're doing one program with the, the University College at the University of Maryland in, in India, and I know that's just going on, that just started a little while ago, and I'm hoping that will be a model of a success for cooperation with you guys, and then we could do that with more courses in more countries, because we could broadcast it from a studio here. You don't have to be in India. You could teach a course in your particular uh, uh, expertise uh, in this area. Well, thank you. Thank you.